Welcome, welcome. Well, my name is Shamel Idiokitis, and I serve as the Assistant Vice President for Community Relations here in Northeastern. It's an honor to be with you all this evening. Thank you to Dr. Thompson and the whole faculty and staff over at the Graduate School of Education for allowing me a few minutes to speak. Um, thank you to my colleagues, my, all my other colleagues in Northeastern that are here in the building. And also thank you to our superintendent, Mary Skipper, for being here as well. Um, Dr. Thompson said I have two minutes, so I'll, I'll spare any stories that I was gonna share. <laughs> um, but I tell my friends all the time that Boston is changing and Boston is definitely changing in a good way. As a, for me, as a, as a young man who grew up in Roxbury, um, as a young man who also graduated from a Boston public school, uh, also a parent of two BPS students and a proud husband of a BPS nurse. Yep, yep, that's like the four, four times, right? <laughs> um, that change is, is, feels hopeful. It feels refreshing. It feels like this room, it feels good. And I think, I know there's still a lot of work to do at the, at the BPS front and at the education front, but I think we're all in this room because we believe in that hopefulness. Um, we definitely, we, we can agree that we have an obligation to carry on kind of that change for the next generation. And I think that's why opportunities like the McFarland Scholarship and this partnership with BPS are extremely important because it allows us to envision that change, but not only envision it, but be active participants in the change for our young people. So this evening is special, it's a special, I know, I know the students have already started and they're on their way in, in their programs, but I think it's a special start either way. And it's, uh, it's a special start, not only for the McFarland scholars, but for the, for the young uh, girls and boys that sit in the BPS schools every day. You know, so it's a good opportunity for them to see a shining example of what could be. So thank you to our scholars that are here and congratulations for receiving that scholarship. Thank you for being stewards in this ever evolving ecosystem of education. Um, thank you for always staying true and providing an outlet for our young people. Um, the seeds have been planted in you all and and tonight and furthermore, we're gonna keep watering it, we're gonna keep feeding it, and keep giving you love, courage, support as you move along your journey. So thank you guys for being here. Um, before I leave, I gotta share an African proverb because I'm a, I'm a grandson of a, a Baptist preacher from Liberia. So it's an African proverb that's, that some of you probably already know, it's a popular proverb, but it definitely resonates with me. And it reads, if you wanna go fast, you know it, right? Yeah, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together, all right? So I challenge everyone in this room, whether you're a scholar, whether you're a teacher, whether you're an NU uh, representative, I challenge you to uplift someone in your community, whether it be a family, friend, or the person at the bodega, uplift them, because that change that I talked about earlier only happens if we do it together, okay? So thank you all, good evening, and enjoy. Thank you, Shamel, for that welcome. I can't even hope to match that charisma, uh, so I'm glad to put him in the beginning. My name is Stephanie Krzyzewski, and I work to steward our philanthropic resources at the College of Professional Studies. And the McFarland Scholarship is one of my favorite pieces of philanthropy that we have at the college. So I'm super happy to be here to tell you guys a little bit about the background of the scholarship itself and the person who established it. Her name was Helen McFarland. I wish I could have met her. Um, but we don't know a whole lot about her. She passed away in 1989 and didn't really leave a paper trail. But what we do know is that she established a scholarship at Northeastern and entrusted us with it. And so that tells us a little bit about her. She was a Boston Public Schools teacher in the mid-1950s and became assistant principal of John Winthrop School in Dorchester. And she lived, worked, and got her degree during um, desegregation in Boston. And so I like to think that she witnessed the mismatch between practice and policy that? Um, yes. while she was working. And that's what, it, that's what uh, encouraged her to establish a scholarship to support teachers working in the urban classroom. She understood 
the specialness of the urban classroom and the need to support our teachers. Um, and I like to think that she would be proud of our partnership with BPS. This is our first time really bringing the scholars together as a community, starting to bring this into a real program because of our partnership with BPS. That's really what kicked this off. And so I hope that the McFarland scholars in the room, those that aren't with us in the room, will always feel the connection to Helen and to each other through receiving the scholarship. So thank you. And I'm gonna invite Rashawn Martin up to welcome for BPS. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so glad to be here. Uh, I'm Rashawn Martin, and I'm the Acting Managing Director for Retention, Cultivation, and Diversity Programs for the Boston Public Schools, which is a part of our uh, Division of Equity uh, Strategy and Opportunity Gaps, uh, led by uh, Dr. Charles Granson. Um, you know, having this partnership is uh, just um, life-changing, really, in a lot of ways. You know, our office is really was created to, uh, to help to close gaps. Now we have one that, that, that's talking about students, but we have gaps for educators, right? And we know some of the biggest barriers for our staff, especially our staff of color, to become the licensed professional educators that we need in order for us uh, to retain them for the long run is, is getting a degree, right? Which is required by the Department of Ed. And as well as it should be, right? We hold our students to high standards. We hold our faculty to high standards also. So, so how do we help the community in order to come uh, to get over those hurdles, right? I mean, those barriers to, to get licensed, to pass the Intel exams, you know, to get the degrees that they need. And so when, uh, so when partnerships uh, and partnership opportunities like, you know, like with Northeastern come, uh, we are delighted uh, in the VPS uh, to, work, uh, to work with them. Um, so I'm thrilled uh, to have the scholars who are all uh, in place. Um, and our current scholars, if you uh, saw a couple here in the room, if you just want to stand real quick. All right. All right. Um, now, they're doing the real work in the trenches. I'm hanging out at bowling, just trying to figure it out. <laughs> you know, so, um, but I'm happy to do so. So um, just sort of thrilled to be here, and um, certainly more work to do. We look forward to having more you know, um, applicants for the program and growing the scholarship, and also finding other opportunities to partner with, uh, with Northeastern. And just as one quick example, um, we had recently supported them in a grant application uh, with the Department of Ed um, to, uh, to, to help to grow capacity for, um, for, for preparing people for the MTEL. And so they're working with us um, so we can get more dynamic around our, our transformational Intel, M Intel prep program. And my colleague Justin is here, who's the Intel prep uh, coordinator. We'll be working with them, um, which is great. And, um, and then finally, I can't be remiss about recognizing my lovely wife who's here, Andrea, uh, who is a guidance counselor at Boston Latin School. And she's also a proud Northeastern you know, grad. Um, uh, she got her master's in, uh, um, in, school, uh, in school counseling from here. So that's probably our next conversation to talk about support services, because we know the district and the super is trying to grow capacity in that space, making sure that all the schools have a counselor and a, and a social worker and a family liaison and anything else that they need to support the kids from the non-academic space. So there might be some other opportunities there. So, But in the meantime, um, welcome to everybody, and uh, we are so grateful for uh, for this partnership, and we're going to figure out how we shout it from the rooftops so that uh, more and more of our um, of our BPS uh, educators, um, you know, uh, apply for the opportunity. Thank you. So, of course, I had to write my speech down because I'm so nervous because it's, this is so important. And I get too excited. <laughs> Thank you, Rashan. Um, my name is Lydia Young. I'm the faculty lead for the teacher licensure programs at Northeastern. Um, and I also serve as the McFarland Scholars Lead faculty. Um, I have had the amazing pleasure, as have my colleagues, in partnering with Rashan and his department. Um, and it is the most joyful space to be able to support educators and especially in the stories that I've heard around, this has always been my dream. And it brings me such joy to be able to help folks meet that goal, both academic, 
personal and professional. Um, we, uh, as Rashawn mentioned, you know, a, a lot of the barriers that we know around teacher licensure has to do with the cost, right? Um, and the McFarland Scholarship allows us to help people overcome that barrier. Um, and we develop varied pathways so that you can complete your bachelor's and go into the MAT. You can earn your MAT or your MED. There are lots of opportunities and we work with individuals because the individuals are where the relationships are. Um, committing to serve in uh, Boston Public Schools and in urban education is for most of us a calling. Um, we see need, we uh, see opportunity gaps, and we want in. We want to be part of the solutions and we want to so ugh, help support, educate, and love young people in their um, attainment of academic personal and professional goals. As we know, education changes everything. Um, it offers lots of opportunity. And so the McFarland Scholarship is more than just money. It's more than financial. Uh, I personally graduated from an urban focused scholars program. And um, one of the things that was similar to the McFarland Scholars Program is how revered our educators are, who commit and who pursue education, both teaching and leading and loving our kids, right? Um, in contexts where you're uniting theory and practice, in places where you are developing your knowledge and skills to become culturally sustaining educators, and it informs our professional identities. To identify as a McFarland Scholar, because tonight is our inaugural event, um, you all get to be the cohort that kicks it off and really makes it very special for those who have gone before you and those who are coming um, behind you. So we hope that our, um, tonight our illustrious panelists offer insights on the collaborative work um, of the McFarland Scholars, Boston's principals, superintendents, educators, College of Professional Studies Graduate School of Education, and Northeastern University as we all seek to close opportunity gaps for all learners, with the teachers and their students. Um, and to continue to develop part, uh, collaborative strategies so that we have an opportunity to meet the needs of schools, to diversify their teaching uh, population, and to better reflect Boston's uh, student population, and to create opportunities, regardless of what school you went to and where you're headed, that there is a pathway for you, and there's a very special place for you. So I now introduce Dr. Corliss Thompson, um, this evening's moderator and our fearless leader as the Associate Dean for the Graduate School of Education. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Um, already, we've had some great conversations, and I've learned so much about what's happening in the schools, what's happening across our community, and it's just been a pleasure to see and hear so many BPS alum, alum, current employees, family members, et cetera, really be here to talk with all of us about this. So um, tonight we're gonna have a brief panel because this is a, um, an important moment for us. This is also a space, right, where we see so many different challenges in the world broadly. Um, and we know that education has the opportunity and the power to make those changes. And one of the other things that I'm so excited about is that we are here really representing the whole scope of education and learning because you know the, it starts with our babies that are um, early childhood and kindergarten and they continue on across that trajectory and become um, lifelong learners. And we know that that's what it's gonna take to solve for some of the challenges we have today. Um, so I am the Associate Dean. I'm the new Associate Dean. I've been in the role since July 1 and I'm excited about where we're going. Um, and this type of work is exactly what we need to be doing and, and where we're going to do it. So tonight we have a panel to talk through some of these ideas with us. So I'm just gonna briefly call out the panelists' names. They will introduce themselves more when they get up here, but I'm really excited to welcome um, our superintendent of Boston Public Schools, Mary Skipper, to the panel. I'd also like to welcome um, Vice Provost Carl Reed, our Chief Inclusion Officer at Northeastern University. 
And I'd also like to welcome um, Dean Radhika Sation, the Dean of the College of Professional Studies here at Northeastern University. All right. And we're gonna have a conversation, but also as we're talking, I want you to think about your comments, your questions, because we will have time at the end for that. And I talked with a lot of you already, and I know we have a, a big group of thinkers um, in this particular space. Um, so really excited to, to begin to, to welcome that. So before I start off with a question, um, I just wanna tell you a little bit about kind of where I sit and where I'm coming from in urban education. In the School of Ed and within the College of Professional Studies, we have bachelor's degree programs, bachelor completion programs, we have master's programs, and we have doctoral programs. And I see across that spectrum the opportunities and intersections with urban education. Um, and really, whether you are studying urban education as a researcher, or you're in the schools, you're doing the work of teaching, um, or you're beginning into the space at the bachelor's level, there's many different connections. So the first question that I have, I'd love to start with our superintendent, um, is really about, um, you know, if you could introduce yourself, your role, and then tell us kind of what you see as the biggest problem within urban education. Sure, so good evening, uh, and I really am honored to be here, and to be here with so many of our staff from BPS. I'm excited for you. Congratulations to those who have already been in the program, uh, and I look forward to meeting you uh, during the, uh, the afterwards. So um, my name is Mary Skipper, and I'm the proud superintendent of BPS. Uh, I'm sort of the new superintendent in that it's eight weeks into the tenure. However, I uh, spent 20 years in the BPS prior. And uh, in many ways, BPS raised me, like it's raising some of you as educators. I started as a teacher, I became a principal, uh, and then uh, principal of Tech Boston Academy. And then from there, I went into uh, the high school network, uh, like Dr. McIntyre, and uh, I supported a group of high schools. And uh, I loved every minute of it. For the, last, um, for the last five, seven years, I was in Somerville as the superintendent. And when we talk about calling, when I heard that BPS had need and I knew the potential of BPS, I felt like this was the moment and, um, and if it, I feel like it is. Uh, the team that's in BPS is incredible. And uh, I just, being able to harness that talent for our students to bring to life equity in education it's an it's honor of a lifetime. So um, here I am, and uh, I'm an honored guest on this panel as well. All right, next I'll go to our Vice Provost, Carl Reed. Would love to know about your background. Tell us who you are, your role, and, and how does your work connect to urban education? I probably am the most non-traditional on, on, the, on the panel, I believe so. I started as an engineer. Um, and engineers, in, in an era where engineers didn't focus on people, right, we focused on things. Um, but about junior year, I was elected to a position in, in, in the uh, chapter, the MIT chapter of the National Society of Black Engineers to begin to build outreach programs for that chapter in Cambridge and Boston. And I partnered with a gentleman by the name of Richard Mullins, who was running the Massachusetts Pre-Engineering Program, MassPath. We had college students who wanted to go out to schools, and he had schools that needed college students. And it was just a serendipitous marriage. When I, when I raised the money and worked with a mentor to raise the money, $5,000 from Arthur D. Little to start to bring students to, to MIT to see classes and uh, visit, uh, do design work, and stay overnight, et cetera, something happened. I didn't want to be an engineer anymore. Because that aha moment that I saw in young children who saw themselves as an engineer or a scientist or didn't see themselves as an engineer or a scientist, which is almost as important, um, I said I wanted to do something about that. So I finished my degrees uh, in engineering. I went to work for IBM. I worked in 12 years. But my calling, I got a notice back from MIT that they needed someone to run the engineering outreach program's office where I get paid to do what I love to do. And I came back and did that. And then in part time, I got a doctorate in education and went to a complete shift uh, as well. Um, right before taking this job, I was the executive director of the National Society of Black Engineers, the very organization that in the role that I was when I got the call from Richard Mullins. So it was just this full circle moment as well. 
Um, so 1980s, I was involved in Cambridge and Boston schools and bringing kids to, to schools. In 1990s, I worked for IBM and they had a program where partnership with Junior Achievement, I taught economics uh, for kids uh, in, in Hyde Park. Uh, and in 2000s, I worked with uh, Jeff Howard in the Boston Campaign for Proficiency. Uh, and now I'm back in 2020 working with uh, probably the most innovative institution, not just higher education, but innovative institution I've ever been a part of at Northeastern University. And so the word that Shamel and others talked about often that was really powerful was partnership. And that's what I see in my role. My role at, as a Chief Diversity Officer is not to necessarily create something new, but a constructivist approach to build on what exists and bring or, or organization and coordination and answer the so what question. We are committed to creating an inclusive, diverse institution where people of all identities, backgrounds, and experiences can thrive, have academic and research and, and professional success. That is our commitment. And the way we are executing that commitment is not from my office, from my perch as the chief inclusion officer, or from the president's office, but every single leader across the university is taking ownership of this. So it moves us from being a strategy to being an ethos, a mindset. And that's, what, that's why I think uh, Northeastern is gonna continue to, to shine, because we believe in this deep in our DNA. Thank you, Carl. Um, next, we'll go to Radhika, and would love to ask you to introduce yourself and your role, and, and how do you see your connection to urban education? I'm not even going to try to, to uh, follow yeah. Carl. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I have been at Northeastern since July, and uh, the College of Professional Studies includes a range of programs. Um, all the way from bachelor completion certificates, foundation year, uh, Balfour Academy. We serve middle schoolers from uh, various underserved populations and districts, all the way through to providing pathways for these students to come to institutions like Northeastern or other universities, should they choose to go. So the mission that CPS brings is everything from when you think about going to college to when you decided you didn't want to finish college and you really did want to come back and finish college to you're a professional and you need to get some training. And then eventually, of course, if you choose to get a professional doctorate and continue serving in higher level roles. I think what is exciting uh, to take a step back, I am all of those people. I was a, I lived in a three bedroom, two, three room house with a leaky roof. I didn't know it was a problem, right? It just was the house we had. And my, my, my family sent me to a, a great English speaking school. And um, I didn't know that I could be anything other than what I wanted to be. My world was the library. So when I wanted to escape, I would go to the local library and read books. And the consequence, of course, is that my language was good enough for me to get a good score in the GRE and get scholarships to come to the US. And how did I do that? Because my sister was working and she could afford to pay my application fees. And the US Embassy was next door to the college. And they had like this program for education foundation where you have, you know, they, they tell you about American universities. I thought, why not? Well, no one told me that I couldn't do it. So, my, eventually I finished my degree in, in economics, went into technology, worked in Bell Labs in a couple of different countries, and then <coughs> stumbled into higher education and started up, you know, at the community college level. Access, we need to do something. And then I went to, uh, you know, UCLA, where it's the creation of knowledge was everything. And I thought, wait, I need both. We need to create knowledge, serve the community, and be part of it and, and support social justice through economic mobility. How are we gonna do that? Remember, I'm an economist. So, it brings me right around to Northeastern. I am, there are times when I think about this, that sometimes you have a job that you're lucky enough to get where your whole life prepares you for. It's what you said. You stop and you think, wait, this is, 
everything I always ever wanted to have as part of my ability to serve. And so I, I feel privileged and, and humbled. Northeastern has, doesn't just dream, we actually do. And the idea that you can be experience-based and you can have impact with everything you do, that's our brand. And so I would, I would say for us, it's an honor to serve McFarland Scholars, to serve all of you, to serve Boston Public Schools, uh, to serve the, the communities we're in, and we're in you know, multiple communities across the country and, and countries. So that's my commitment. Whatever you need to do that you think we should be doing, CPS is here to help you do it. Thank you. As I sit here and I listen to these stories, I'm just like, wow, you know, this is an example of people that have had educations that have taken them to these different places and spaces. And I think about the teachers that helped you all get to these different spots. And I think about, um, you know, the Dean just said, we're doers, right? And so uh, what we know is that not all children are getting these experiences that lead them to this space. And that's where our responsibility, I think, lies. So, I mean, let's, let's do, like, let's get concrete. And I would love to know, you know, even more specifically, um, kind of a, from where each of you are sitting, kind of what is the thing that you are kind of working on and, and doing, and, and what, what knowledge can you offer to the group about steps that, that you can take, that we can take, as we move forward together as a community of, of educators to really move this forward. Um, so I'll start with um, the superintendent again. I'd love to know your sure. thoughts. <clears throat> so, you know, I think part of what we're doing here and celebrating is an opportunity. It's, a, it's both a challenge and an opportunity that we have right now in education, um, particularly in the K-12 space, and that is uh, teacher pipeline, you know, human capital pipeline. I think um, even before the pandemic, I think the pandemic was a, a tipping point, but even before then, I think for, for teachers, we were really missing key opportunity. We, we had a, you know, a big focus on recruitment, but then what happened to development, retention, and advancement? Um, you know, I look at my career and each, at each point, I had somebody that believed in me, a program that offered me something, a cohort to support me, and uh, were it not for that, I would not have been able to advance. And so what really pleases me and excites me about the McFarland Scholarship Program is that that's helping us as BPS carry that mission out. And you know, uh, for our RCD, for our, our Recruitment uh, Cultivation and Diversity Area that Rayshawn talked about, you know, I think for us it is imperative with 85% of our students being black or brown, special education, or a multilingual learner, that it is incumbent on us to make sure that our workforce is both reflective, linguistically, racially, experienced, but also prepared. Prepared not just to get the job, but to stay in the job, to develop in the job, to meet the needs of the students in front of them. And that's gonna be a very intentional process that's gonna require a lot of resources, intentionality, programming, asking the educators, are we getting it right? And having the courage to ask that question. And having talented, committed people like Rishan and other, others at BPS Central who are willing to do that and willing to, to build and construct those partnerships with places like Northeast. Um, we also need to do a national call for teaching. You know, I think it's, it's an opportunity. It's a huge opportunity right now. It is, it, there's very few professions that are as hard but is rewarding. You know, I look back at all the different opportunities I had in my career in different positions, and the one I enjoyed the most was being a teacher. Because the students were right there, I could see my impact. Sometimes it was years later, but I could see that impact. Whereas, as you hold other positions, sometimes you get further away from the students, it's harder to see that. But it's also a harder position there is no harder position than being an educator, teacher in the classrooms in that way, or being a social worker, directly working with our students, because you are everything to them. And that's where, for me, as a, a superintendent, I think there's a huge opportunity to redefine in BPS what development and support looks like, you know, what advancement opportunities look like, so that our retention 
is there. People want to stay in the profession. People aren't looking for other things to do. And that comes with us being very creative and seeking out deep partnerships like this one, where no matter what the role is of the educator, they can grow and advance in their education, they can grow and advance in their experience, they can go outside of the school system to see what it is they're teaching in an applied way. I know with Carl, that, that's a, that was a big piece of the engineering programming, is if you're teaching engineering, what does that look like? when you go out, not just for the student, but for the teacher. So if we do that right, we give our teachers the social emotional support, the, 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 you know, the training, it used to be de-escalation, trauma sensitive practice. These were all things we talked about that were what we call tier two and three, things that only certain groups of students need. That isn't anymore. Every student needs that support, every student. And so it isn't just about getting the job. It's incumbent on us to support you through that, both with positions of expertise in those areas, but also giving you training and PD in those areas so you can execute and carry your job out well. So that's, to me, the challenge and the opportunity of calling teachers back into a field that I think is the best field ever. My oldest daughter is a teacher, and it's one of the proudest things I have. Um, I won't cry. Um, but it really is because I hear her struggles, and she's been teaching now 15 years, right? So by 15 years, you're, you're up there, you know, you, you got it. But still, she has her struggles. And when I hear them, I also hear all the rewards. And we need to lay that vision out for the young people, our students, as future pipeline, and build those pipelines from our students, our paraprofessionals, like many of you who have a dream to teach. Give that, give that ability to complete that dream. I saw there was a dean of students among our recipients. Perfect, that dean of students has been working with students, now can potentially go into a classroom. We need to lay that pipeline out in a very concrete way and bring it to our educators every day. Thank you, there are so many different themes there, but definitely that space around pipelines has me thinking about a lot of the work within CPS, and I just wonder, um, Radhika, um, do you want to pick up there and, and help us think a little bit more about kind of what you're seeing into the future as you're looking as the Dean of Pro College of Professional Studies in terms of the workforce and this pipeline backwards into the, the K-12 space? First, I just loved everything you said. I think the whole idea of career planning and sort of skill building is, um, is, is so supportive of people as individuals that that makes up for all the struggle, the daily, why am I, you know, sort of the idea that you, everything is new and with the pandemic, everything feels like it's even more raw and harder to do than it has ever been. Um, my, my comment really with respect to pipelines and pathways is, I would just say that the mission of CPS, and I, I'm sure there are other institutions and certainly other parts of Northeastern that do this, but for CPS, it is about being flexible enough to create the programs in the formats that our students need, right? Because that flexibility is not one that is designed around the program, it's designed around the student. Which is why we're so lucky, I was talking to some of, the, uh, some of our students here, and that was the message. I get up at 8 a.m., I go to work early, and I do my homework. And so th there is a whole practice associated with learning, which is different for everybody. So I'm so proud that we have that mission as part of what we do. Now, I just want to say one thing about where the future, the way I see it, from the lens of an employer, if you will. So my first 15 years are actually spent in technology, right? And the way in which we, we worked on technology was around users, right? So it was mobile technology. In fact, the early versions of all the applications we have. And one of the things that, that um, I've thought about a lot is as, we, as knowledge doubles every, I think, 13 months now, that's the latest, um, just the total amount of information available is doubling every year. So whatever we study now is already out of date a year from now, 
right? So what are the core skills that you can actually take away? And I would offer, it's the ability to learn. So the ability to synthesize and the ability to find the, to be able to think critically about what's fact and what is deep fake, right? So these things are sort of lifelong learner skills, but I, I'm, the fact is I think students have to learn it earlier and earlier now because they have access to all this information. How do you know what you should be learning? So I think what would be interesting if I think about it from the teaching lens is how do our teachers incorporate those ideas into the way they teach, what they teach about, and how do we practice it? And to me, those skills are what also, my mind, what employers look for, because you, I, I hire this person for what they've learned, and the minute they start, they have to learn something else. So what does that bridge look like, and how do we ensure that this, the graduates of today are continuing to be learners of tomorrow? And I think that's sort of the interesting circle that I would offer. And I think everything professional development fits right into that. So we're going to go to questions in just a minute. So have your questions and comments ready. But I want to go to Carl to get some of his thoughts. As I'm hearing all of these things, I mean, there's an issue of equity, right? There's an issue of inclusion to get here. And I would just love to know more from your perspective, kind of what you're seeing, what, what we're doing at Northeastern, and what you think needs to happen here in you know, all of this conversation. Yeah, um, boy, I tell you, I want to riff off of both of these uh, comments. So Clifton Conrad wrote a book called uh, Cultivating the Inquiry-Driven Learner. And uh, he talked about how, uh, he and the you know, co-author talked about how it's important for 21st century skills of critical thinking, analytical reasoning, problem solving, and writing, and communication as well. Go, and that, that should be sort of beyond the disciplinary silos that we typically teach, although those are really important as well. Uh, in engineering, we call it the T-shaped engineer. Um, the T being you, you have to have a, a discipline, a deep discipline and knowledge, but have to understand across the board multiple disciplines, including engineering, but also sociology, psychology, social psychology, etc., and understand the world that we live in, that people have to be the center of engineering uh, as well. Um, the, the superintendent talked about um, this sense of belonging, Right. That that at the at the at the end of the day, a student showing up or a staff member showing up to work or a faculty member or teacher showing up to work, we know he or she or they will thrive to the degree to which they have that sense of belonging. That they're not thinking about whether or not they're going to be evaluated through inequities or through lenses or partial lenses or implicit lenses, etc. But they just show up. They bring their whole selves to work. And so uh, we at Northeastern have, have begun to prioritize belonging because we recognize through data that certain groups report lower levels of that sense of belonging. And they are the ones that are more likely to leave. They are ones that are more likely to, to, to contribute less because they're always thinking, sort of appraising them the moment and not really applying their full cognitive approach. So to your question, when the president, uh, Ayun, announced in 2020 that Northeastern in the next five years would be representative of the nation and society at the faculty, staff, and student level, most people said, okay, that's good, wonderful, but hundreds of companies were doing the same thing, right after George Floyd was murdered. Pledges, 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 pledges. But then Northeastern did something really unique. They put in place practices and disciplines and data and accountability to achieve that. So you can go on the public dashboard of Northeastern and see how we're doing in incoming faculty, incoming staff, incoming students against those five-year goals. And our senior leadership team is watching those data or watching those data and holding people accountable to achieving that. So back to accountability as well. So we're, we are, we're looking at the equity walk, we're looking at the equity gaps, working to close those, decolonizing our curriculum, making sure that our curriculum, there's, a, there's, a, there's an objective eye. Is it Eurocentric? Is it, should it be much more diverse, the curriculum? How do we teach and the evaluations that occur? We're looking at all of that. Then the next piece is Shamel's area, 
It's, it's how do we show up in the communities in which we operate? We're in 14 communities in the United States and around the world, right? How do we show up? We don't show up as a savior. We don't show up as the, as the solution. We don't show up as the Messiah. We show up as a honest partner, recognizing that those who are doing this work are the experts. Those are people on the ground, the grassroots, the grass tops are the experts. We can provide support. We can provide a catalyst. We can provide uh, resources in order to scale up. So the last thing I'll say is to answer the question is, how do we get to those goals that we set in, in a couple of years ago? We have to scale up programs like this. We have to scale up our Tort Scholars program. We have to scale up the other programs we have at BPS. And how do we do that? By listening first, being a humble partner, understanding what works, and then helping us collectively get to scale. Thank you. There's so much more that we can unpack and talk about here, but I want to go to the audience and get a question or a thought. Um, what are you thinking about? Let's hear some share, share back. Yes, please Hi. introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Keisha Lewis. I'm a McFarland um, scholarship, uh, 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 soon-to-be graduate. And my question basically is, what can we do, both of us who work for KPS, uh, what can we do to kind of help, uh, you know, promote this program and the other programs? Like, what could I do? What can I bring back to my school or um, Union Heavy? What could I bring back to the Union? What could I do to help us, you know, reach these goals together. Because I, I'm so grateful for what I've been given, and I want to make sure that I'm doing my part um, to help others. So, so Keisha, I had actually wanted to connect you and Rashawn again because okay. we had a conversation. And that is, with everyone being so busy, especially for teachers coming in early, staying late, email and in the way we push information out we have to rethink like what is the best way to impress the importance of the program of being very life-changing the best way to do that is to have ambassadors so one of the ways we could do it is you know to have those that are McFarland scholars now or just got it be an ambassador and be able to talk maybe at a staff meeting you know, we could talk with the union and Just Tang about how to be able to have the union meetings be able to get that information out. So that we're increasing the, the pool and the number of our educators who realize the opportunity. I think the other thing is to, you know, to Carl's point, to, to dialogue about what else could we do. So those of you that are going through the program, are there supports that either BPS or Northeastern could give that would help make it more sustainable and doable for you as an active educator. That would be another one. So these are, I, I think it's, you hold the expertise because you are the scholarship recipients. So you know better than anyone. And so tapping into that, and then having mentoring between the cohorts, so those that just went through it can actually mentor those about to go through it. Thank you. Can I just say one quick thing? Uh, there's a, I'm always, I was never a reader growing up, so I quote books a lot now because I'm married to a reader. Um, uh, and I stayed in a Holiday Inn Express last night. But, um, seriously, there's a great book called, um, or at least a, a line of thinking called The Tempered Radical. Uh, Deborah Meyerson has is, is, is written about this, and she talks about how do you change an organization from the inside? And I think this is what you're asking. And the, the range could be what you can do as an individual to what you can do with allies. And the most effective, obviously, is the finding allies. So Mary talked about sort of partnering with Roshan and others. Finding the allies and thinking about the strategy. And the best place to start is at a whiteboard. Just to think about where is the goal? What do we want to accomplish? And working our way backwards, I think that's, that's so very, very powerful. But finding more allies, and you have one, the, probably the most powerful one in the room, uh, right here. Uh, to really move things along. And we're allies too. I mean, we can be a convener to help with these conversations. We need to do more of this. I know I've spoken with Rashawn about ways that we can continue to convene 
um, people that are working for BPS, and, and we want to be able to do that. So definitely more to come, more that we can do there. I saw Kiana's Hi. hand. So first, I just want to say thank you to everyone for all of your work, all of your support. Um, it's an honor to be the Fallen Scholar. It's definitely changed my life already. Um, but in that perspective, and uh, piggybacking on what Keisha said, from within, I think it's also important, instead of always going to like top down, to kind of start within, because I started as a paraprofessional, and I just recently went into the teacher role. So I think it's extremely important to kind of go inside and kind of figure out what are the paths, right? We have all these pathway programs, but nobody's really going in to talk to the paras and or recommendations from teachers who have these paths. So I think it's instrumental to work from within and start that with maybe surveys and or just, you know, people coming in to kind of observe what's going on in the classrooms. But I do appreciate all of you and I thank you very much. Like an invitation to your classroom. <laughs> room 201. Room 201. Do it. All right. Well, um, we, um, we, we will have some time after the panel to continue the conversations. And so don't go anywhere. Let's continue the conversations. I do want to go back to the panelists for any final words, call to action, thoughts. Um, and uh, we'll start with um, Superintendent. Sure. I mean, first, just overwhelming thanks. Um, for you know coming into this role we've been talking about Boston being a village and sometimes one of the hardest parts about our village is that there's a lot of resources but the resources don't always get connected to the people that can use them and this is an example of a partnership that does right this is an example of a partnership that we have educators wanting to go on and develop and an organization that's willing to step into that space and do it so just a big thanks in that way. Um, I, I just, I also just want to say I'm really proud. I don't know all of you, and I hope to tonight to at least, you know, if I haven't already, uh, at least talk with you a little bit about your classroom, but I'm really genuinely proud of you because I know how hard the work's been in the last couple of years. And the fact that not only are you doing the work, but you in, in the process advanced yourself or are advancing yourself tells me so much about you. So I'm just really proud, and this is why I'm proud to be in BPS. Like, this district is gonna rock. <laughs> I, I, I used to joke when, uh, when LeBron James announced, James announced he was going to Miami, he says, I'm taking my talents to Miami. And I said, boy, wouldn't it be great if, like, teachers were paid like athletes and athletes like teachers. So a teacher would say, I'm taking my talent to, you know, the John D. O'Brien or whatever, Madison Park. Um, I, 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 I remember um, listening to or uh, reading Ron Siskin's, uh, Siskin's work at Hope in the Unseen. And it was about a program I used to run at MIT called MITES, uh, Minority Introduction to Engineering and Science. And, um, and it was about this young man, Cedric Jennings, who really struggled from Baloo High School in DC, came to uh, MIT, struggled a little bit, went to Brown, struggled, but ultimately graduated. I met uh, Cedric as well. And as I was thinking about this question, the, the, the phrase of that book really came to mind. Um, teachers, a hope in the unseen. You have the ability to see hope in the unseen. And we, as Northeastern, want to help you do that and help you um, get to scale and to increase your effectiveness in doing that. Well, I celebrate you. I, I was sitting with my 95-year-old mother uh, the other day and naming all of my teachers from kindergarten on. And I still remember them. Now I'm getting, getting choked up. I still remember them um, because they took interest in me. So keep doing what you're doing, educators. I, we love you very much, and we are there with you. I feel like the lunch, post lunch speaker now. <laughs> uh, I just want to say I'm. I, you know, I, I, I feel really lucky to be here. And I know that I am, 
I look around and I think about the 1.2 billion people that is India. And when I asked my mom, when she was visiting uh, about de a decade ago, what made you send a 19 year old across to another country one way, pre-internet, right? Uh, everything we knew about Hollywood was either in the Westerns, really, uh, <laughs> they are a thing, um, or like, you know, sort of the uh, LA and everybody driving around in fancy cars. So I came to Boston, uh, my first year in the US, so it's a full circle in that sense. Um, I just want to say my final, my final thought is, um, you all represent the core belief that I, I certainly wake up every morning and think about, which is every mind, every person can do anything they wish. It's a, it's a fundamental belief in someone's ability to transform themselves that each of you as teachers and your, your organization, Mary, ha is doing every day. And I think for those of us who are helping and enabling and supporting, for me it's very humbling and I, all I can say is thank you. And anything we can do, I hope you know, we're here to help you do it. The final word goes to um, Dr. Noor Ali, who is one of the faculty members in the program. So she'll just close us out with a couple of words. Um, so I teach here at the Graduate School of Education in all three programs, the MAT, the MED, and the EDD. And I was really excited to see the roster of the scholars because a lot of them are students and I'm glad to see some of them in person as well. I think this night is a testimony to Northeastern's commitment to change agency towards facilitating transformative educational spaces, whether it's in higher ed or in the K through 12 setting. Um, in another way, this is also a testimony to that partnership that Shamel referenced early on, of going farther if you're going together. I think there's such an emphasis in our lives in the education system about preparing students for career readiness that we often forget that before career readiness is community readiness is being ready to be a part of the community. And I think that the McFarland Scholars Program exhibits just that. It's that partnership, it's that community growing together um, with Northeasterns coming together and facilitating change agency in educators in the K through 12 setting in the Boston Public School. So it's really exciting to, I, I mean, you all were here, you all heard the panel. Um, fantastic conversations there. Um, Part of the work that I've done is I, I lead the transformative school leadership in the EDD. And what's really important is not to go for bandage solutions, um, but to go for solutions that really shape the way schools are. And we shape schools when we look at culture, when we look at the work, the soul work that we put in. People ask me to define teaching and I say it's soul work. That's what it is. It's not just the work of intellect, of learning, of content, curriculum, standards, common core, DESI, et cetera. It's soul work, that's what it is. Um, DESI, we all know, has made a pretty bold uh, call towards culturally relevant pedagogy. Uh, we're all seeing the new rubrics come up, right? Um, and the stance towards an anti-racist education is bold. Um, and Northeastern is answering that call in the program that it offers, in the commitment that it has towards diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice. Um, so I'll leave us with this, wherever you are on your journey, on your educational journey, whether it's the bachelor's, master's, or the doctorate program, please know that Northeastern is here to support that journey. You're not doing this alone. Um, and Northeastern is committed to recruiting at least 10 every year BPS educators through the McFarland Scholarship Program. So yes, spread the word out, Keisha. Um, you know, there's, there's resources to share, so why not, right? And, and it's not a journey that one's taking alone. Uh, it's, it's really well supported. Um, we have it here, and we want to be a part of that journey together. Thank you all for being here tonight. I won't stop you from refreshments. Um, I know everyone wants to talk and mingle, so have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.